All right, everybody. Welcome. Welcome back. It is the 22nd, and we are so excited that everybody is here. Um, so for those of you who are just getting signed on, just go ahead and give us a shout out in the Q&A box. And we have a little bit of a different question. Um, so since eating is, seems to be all that we seem to be able to do right now, being stuck in our homes, uh, what has been your go-to quarantine snack? Go ahead and let us know in the Q&A box. Let us know that you're here. Um, while you're doing that, I'll take care of a couple of introductions and housekeeping items. Uh, my name is Taylor Husk, and I'm going to be your host today. So welcome. I am so glad that everybody is able to join us. So we are scheduled for 60 minutes, and we're going to try to do 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Uh, we do encourage your participation, so please, throughout the session, go ahead and put those questions into the Q&A box, and we will try to get those answered at the end. Please type you know, anything that you need. If you have any technical difficulties, please also put that into the Q&A box as well. Our team will try to get that issue resolved for you, try to get that troubleshooted. As far as recordings of the webinar today, we will be sending the recording via email uh, with CE information, and we will be posting the recordings of this webinar to our Facebook group. Uh, our goal is to offer CE credit for all of the courses. The evaluation and the quiz will be sent today, and your CE certificates will be issued within one to two weeks. Um, all right, so with all of that out of the way, it is my absolute pleasure I'm going to introduce to you our presenter, Dr. Amy Donin. Uh, Dr. Donin, she is an international leader in the prevention of heart attacks, strokes, and diabetes, and is the co-founder in the Bill Donin Method. Dr. Donin holds multiple professorships at medical and dental universities across the nation. Uh, one of Dr. Donin's recent peer-reviewed publications has been widely hailed as a landmark in the media and scientific communities because it was the first to identify periodontal pathogens as a contributing cause of cardiovascular disease. This discovery could lead to new oral systemic treatments to prevent arterial plaque buildup, fostering a team approach in which medical and dental providers work together to provide the optimal science-based care advised by the Bale Donin Methods Tech University Health Science Center. We also have Dr. Cooch joining us. He is the founder of Carry Free and an internationally recognized speaker. He's published hundreds of papers in dental and medical journals, and we are so lucky to have him as our resident Carry's risk management expert. Uh, so, Dr. Cooch, I will let you officially hand it over to Dr. Donin. Hey, thank you so much, Taylor. It's great to hear your voice as well. I haven't seen you since the first week of March with all this social distancing, so it's uh, great to connect with you here. Uh, <laughs> it's Amy, so good to be back. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, and, Amy, uh, I just first off want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule. I know your life has to be a bit crazy right at the moment as well. And to the audience, I just want to say about Amy, I, I first met her I close to 10 years ago at the very first AOSH meeting in Cleveland and have connected with her multiple times. And for the last three years, uh, she has been my personal physician, both Dana and I, and have referred a number of people to her in Spokane. And so I trust my health and my life with Amy, and I don't know how I can give anybody a bigger uh, welcome and endorsement for that. And I'm excited to hear what you have to say, Amy. Oh, thanks, Kim. Thank you. That's very generous. I, I am so appreciative. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank Kendall and uh, Taylor for your work behind the scenes. I, this is the second talk that I've had the honor to give to your group, and um, I have to say that uh, Kendall um, is an amazing organizer from behind the scenes, as is Taylor. So I want to thank you both for, for hosting this. And, um, Kim, thank you again for, for allowing me to be on, be on this platform. I normally, in the last talk I gave, really did talk about our oral systemic paper, which looked at high-risk periodontal pathogens on how they affect the atherogenic triad, um, finally stating causality, and that was really important to us. Um, just as an aside, I obviously am on the medical side of this journey, but my respect and... Um, appreciation of the dental world is, is just tremendous in the world of cardiovascular disease specifically. I feel like we cannot run a cardiovascular prevention effective program without your help. So with that being said, I'm doing something a little bit out of the box for me today, um, but I felt it was important when I was asked 
um, to, to give a talk here um, on this platform, I thought, you know, part of my world deals with stress and um, psychosocial, which I believe psychosocial is on par, psychosocial stress and depression is on par with all the other root causes of cardiovascular disease, such as cholesterol, blood pressure, insulin resistance, genetically inherited lipid abnormalities like lipoprotein A, yes, endodontic lesions, yes, high-risk periodontal lesions. Um, I could go on and on sleep and airway. And so in this weird time that we're in, I was especially touched and continue to be so on what a hit um, my dental colleagues have taken from this. I feel like dentistry, above all other specialties in healthcare, has probably taken the biggest um, hit from this. And so I kind of wanted to recognize that, and I've been searching through the literature a little bit. And so my intent of the next hour is really just to share with you some of the literature and really to allow you to absorb this for your own health benefit and also to kind of wrap why you might be feeling some of these things with some data to support it, and then end the talk with some proactive things we can all do to keep ourselves healthy. So that is my goal of today. Um, the outline I have is the following. Oh, I need to use these arrows. Okay. Um, first, I want to recognize the grief process of changing our relationships as they stand right now with our patients and with our coworkers and others. I want to discuss the health consequences of stress, depression, and anxiety that many people are feeling in light of this social distancing situation. I want to share some data on creating opportunities to stay connected. And I want to help find a sense of normalcy in this unknown future that everybody's in. And then lastly, I want to just say this. Using our demands for change as an opportunity to create innovation and improvement in practice, um, I feel very strongly that the whole world is turned upside down. Every delivery um, module, healthcare delivery system is challenged right now. So with that being said, it's a really great opportunity to make system changes within our practices, whether they be medical or dental, and have sort of the social permission to do so. Patients are expecting change. Your staff is expecting change. Everyone is expecting change, so this allows us the opportunity to do that, which is really, really rare. Because as we kind of move through life and the busyness of clinical practice, it's very hard to make a protocol change within our offices. This is a wonderful opportunity to use these, these crazy times to rock our world just a little bit, so I want to address that. Okay. So um, let's talk about this new normal that we're in. And I want to do so by labeling it, um, as many have done. Recognize the grief process um, that we're dealing with during this time of social distancing, changing relationships and care delivery challenges that everyone is feeling. Dr. George Bonanno, um, PhD, talked about this um, in his literature um, this month in April. And I want to just kind of go over some high, high points that he mentioned. He said grief is natural, and most people are resilient. Um, grief is really about turning inward and recalibrating and thinking. This is not the way the world is anymore, and I need to adapt somehow. His research was optimistic. It said that once a crisis has passed, most people are able to bounce back and move on with their lives successfully. People should expect to fluctuate between moments of sadness and mourning, coupled with moments of acceptance and even happiness, he said. Um, people who cope well with loss usually move in and out of those states rather unpredictably. It's okay to allow yourself to be distracted and entertained at the same time and even to laugh. Um, I've had a lot of interactions with people who feel guilty that they're not as productive with their time as they thought they would be if they're at home. And I think uh, Dr. Bonanno's work actually gives us permission to say that's actually a normal feeling. Um, shaking our sense of self, losing places, projects, possessions, even professions and protections, both economically and otherwise, is part of this process. This pandemic, and he's speaking specifically to COVID-19, forces us to confront the frailty of such um, attachments. The lack of clarity can make it really hard to move forward. As the pandemic has evolved, people had to confront a series of losses. 
um, including jobs and financial security. You can experience grief over anything that feels like a loss of identity. We often think of grief as losing a loved one, but it's loss of our comfort zone in some cases. And the result of prolonged grief without recognition can lead to anxiety and depression. And I'm going to circle back later in the talk and show how unaddressed anxiety and depression can affect our heart attack and stroke risk. All right. So moving on with him, he said it was really important to name and claim what we feel we are losing in the context of this pandemic. It is an organized way of taking action, giving it a name to help people cope with their losses, whether that's their jobs, relationships, sources of self-worth, economic stabilization, and even self-efficacy or, or other reasons. Name what you're losing individually and collectively and write about your personal strengths and coping skills. What are you doing to, to help how you feel? Most of us have never been through anything like this, ever. Um, but we've been through other challenging transitions, obviously. But no one, this is new territory for everybody. Social support can be critical in helping move on from grief rather than getting stuck in it. This possesses a problem in an age of physical distancing when people are isolated in their homes. During this time, there may be an erosion of social support and the meaningful social roles. The idea of giving someone a handshake, a hug, all of that is distracted. Psychologists are encouraging people to stay connected in any means possible through video chat, social media, phone calls, writing, text messages, etc. Why people um, will be resilient to the changes wrought by COVID-19, this global crisis will test others in major ways. As things begin to return to normal, most of us will also return to a kind of normal, albeit changed, of course, by going through this experience. One thing about crisis is that it can galvanize creativity and commitment. We can retreat from it or we can embrace the moment and make proactive changes so when we come out of this tunnel, we're primed and ready to even deliver better care than we realized before. So as, as he mentioned grief, I thought I would very quickly, as many might have forgotten, there's really five stages of grief. And the Kubler-Ross um, and Kessler analysis uh, really highlighted this. And when I was doing my initial dissertation work, this was really a, a hot topic. Um, but there's five areas of grief, and the stages are not meant to help place emotions into packages, of course. And there's not a typical response that one person's going to feel over the other. But it's important to know that it is a process, and it's a scientifically documented process. So the five stages, the first one is denial, and that's perhaps what everyone felt the beginning of March, like seriously, this is really happening? Um, the denial stage helps us to survive the loss. In this stage, the world, the world becomes meaningless and overwhelming, and, and we're kind of rocked, like how are we going to do this? We're kind of in shock. We're in a numbness. Then, usually, we move on to a situation where we feel anger. Um, many in the dental arena are on unemployment right now. Many are scrambling for PPP loans. Many are trying to figure out how to protect their staff and also losing contact with their dear patients that they know need their care unless it's a crisis or an emergency. And that can bring about, about anger, but it is a necessary stage of the healing process. Be willing to admit and feel your anger, even if it seems endless. It's actually a strength, anger is, because it's the most common thing that we're used to dealing with in the, in the grief process. Um, it's, a, it's an emotion that's used to manage things, and it's natural and it's normal. Um, the interesting thing about anger is that it's just another indication of the ten intensity of the love of the thing that you're missing. So the third stage is uh, bargaining. Then we, you know, come around April 1st, we're like, all right, okay, what, what are we going to do? What do I got to do to make this work? Because I don't see an end in sight right now. What do I have to do to make this better? Because I'm willing to do anything to get things back to normal. It begins a wake-up time and a realization that you kind of think, oh, my gosh, this has been a bad dream. You want life to return to what it was before. Um, and it's important to note that we don't go through these stages in any particular order 
Um, there's no always in science. So the always of grief is not existent. So we're all going to kind of shift in and out of these stages. But I wanted to give you permission to feel all of them. And it's an important part of the journey. The, la the fourth stage is depression. And that's when you kind of feel tired. Um, we're grabbing the comfort things like um, I, I love uh, Taylor's question of <laughs> what, what is your favorite snack at home? And, and clinically, I'm still seeing patients, albeit by, by Zoom and, and phone, but I'm calling the COVID-19 diet the BLT diet, which is the bites, licks, and tastes. Everyone at home is, is a little bit too close to the refrigerator, and I think we're going to all come out of this. Um, a lot of people are coming out 5 to 10 pounds different than we went into it. So be respectful of the depression and things that you're using to treat depression. Make sure they're healthy outlets, and I, I will circle back to that. Um, but it's part of the process as well. And then lastly, finally, it's acceptance. It's almost like, okay, this is my new normal. And I think a lot of people are heading into that stage right now. Um, the stage is about accepting the new reality, recognizing that this new reality is a permanent reality. And it's not bad or good. I would envision, as I've heard from many of, of your colleagues um, who are friends and patients, um, that they felt this when the AIDS epidemic came on and dentistry, again, was sort of rocked. And what came out of that were good changes, um, but scary nonetheless. All right. So let's move on with some more data. Um, and, and this particular study looks at the potential health consequences of COVID-19. And all of this literature has been published in the last few weeks or days. And what I found interesting is so much of it is pointed at the dental community. So let's talk about this. This was work um, published again in April on April 6th, um, just a few weeks ago. In recent pandemics, isolation and quarantine, more extreme forms of social distancing, have precipitated depression and anxiety. We might expect to see similar effects as confined people are devoid of purpose, owing to altered routine and livelihood. Um, this contributes to what you might be feeling sometimes, boredom, your mood is down, frustration, potentially depression. Um, anxiety might arise from a fear of, of getting the virus. When do you go back? When, and it's, when is it safe? Do you have enough PPE on board to keep yourself safe? Um, and I want to be respectful. Nothing is perfect. Life is messy. So many of individuals on the line and many colleagues and many people in your offices are entering this already dealing with other things. Maybe it's post-traumatic stress disorder. Maybe it's anxiety, depression, sleep disorder. So they're entering this whole weird time of our history, perhaps with underlying issues that might be exacerbated when this situation has been placed on board. So please be respectful of what other people are dealing with as we head into this. How prevalent are the psychological impacts of COVID-19? Like, how prevalent is this? Um, so this was studied again um, recently, and they, they're getting, obviously, we're getting more and more data out of China because that's where most of the early data came from. So this survey, <coughs> excuse me, was within tw with 1,200 people, and they found when they surveyed these individuals, these professionals, by the way, that 54% roughly assessed the psychological impact of the situation as moderate to severe. 16.5% reported moderate to severe depressive symptoms, 29% moderate to severe anxiety, and 8% were um, identifying moderate to severe stress levels. So as you can see, the majority of people are feeling moderate to severe psychological impact from this crisis in China, and they're about two months ahead of us. So kind of realize that and respect the situation that we're in. Um, psychological intervention in COVID-19, what do we know so far and what can we actually do about it? So um, this data, again published recently at the Department of Mental Health in Spain, looked at a high-risk group. Who does that include? It inv includes individuals who, as a result of the crisis, have been exposed to potentially traumatic events, such as loss of a loved one, obviously, but they cite that, that the 
significant result of this crisis is the ability to work and make a living. So with that being said, they suggest that these individuals who have experienced the change in work, the change in financial outlook, these people may express symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, or complicated grief disorder. This group may not emerge immediately, so you might not be seeing this with your colleagues or yourself until later. Um, and the presentations of this sort of situation may only become apparent after several months. So when we're in June, July, August, September, when we think we should be feeling perfect, and perhaps we're not. Um, this is showing symptoms even after the COVID-19 has peaked. A significant um, percentage of people will experience intense emotional adjustments as a response to COVID. This can include fear, impact of prolonged quarantine, the death of relatives and acquaintances, and then increased social adversity due to the instability with the economic side of the situation. And dentistry, I would argue, has, made, has had the biggest sort of impact um, economically, in my humble opinion. Um, so let me go back to that. Stress, as I've always defined it, and I've always, when I've talked about stress um, on the podium or with a patient individually, I define it as the following. To stress is to perceive a lack of control over your environment, whatever that may be. So the only defense we have then is to change our perception of control. So if we perceive we're in control of what's going on in whatever frame of reference that is, the internal stress mechanisms, the cortisol levels, the cytokine expression, the macrophage development, all of that's going to come down, even if, I might add, the perception is, is wrong. <laughs> but if you change your perception, because you can't change the situation, we change our perception of it, we get less inflammation as a result. Let me show you, because it is fascinating. We used to think that stress was bad on the human body because of, because of the behaviors that it made us do such as when we're stressed, maybe we don't sleep as well. Well, that's bad. Fair enough. Maybe when we're stressed, we eat too many potato chips. Okay, that's fair enough. Maybe people drink too much. Maybe they pick up bad habits like nicotine use or whatever. They're grabbing towards things that ultimately affect health. And while that may be true, I want to challenge us all to realize that the actual lack of perception of control is not healthy, regardless of our behaviors around it. Let me show you. This study looked at MRI imaging of the brain, and it also looked at the spleen and the bone marrow. And it looked at when these little, there's little centers in the base of the brain, just as a sort of biology lesson. Um, they're called amygdala. And they're right here. They're these little almond-shaped centers. And when someone is under the perception of lack of control, these amygdala fire, boom, 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 boom. And they're supposed to because we're made genetically to run from tigers and bears and lions. So these amygdala tell us, hey, you got to do something here. And so when the amygdala fire, they, they were able to show in this very eloquent piece of research that, hey, Things happen regardless of our behaviors. When the amygdala activity is expressed, it upregulated um, such post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and depression. It, boom, activated in those situations. And here's what happened. When those amygdala fired in this particular study, um, immediately macrophage um, cells were produced in, in droves. Little cytokines were expressed on the endothelial wall of the artery sort of priming the pump for arterial wall inflammation to develop. So this was one of the many pieces of literature that caused us to put stress, anxiety, PTSD that's untreated under a root cause tree as equally on par with abnormal lipids, um, blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. So it, just the sheer feeling of lack of control led to this sort of primal result that, that increased fatty streak development and atherosclerotic changes of the artery. All right, so, so if that's happening to you or your colleagues or perhaps your family members, 
what are the potential cardiovascular risks associated with anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress that all of the current literature have said many people are feeling right now? What does that mean? We know that when they've looked at meta-analyses and they show anxiety, they show that when someone is experiencing anxiety, there's a 25% increased risk of coronary heart disease and a 50% risk of cardiac death, and that's when people are followed for 11 years. When we look at specifically post-traumatic stress disorder, which is very common and will express itself perhaps in August and September, um, where people are exhibiting inability to sleep, maybe they're picking up economic pieces that were expressed now, and now they're dealing with it later in the summer. Um, when you look at post-traumatic stress disorder and the symptoms associated with it, it is not healthy for the body. Those who experience more than four symptoms, which could be lack of sleep, um, inability to concentrate, um, nightmares, and then um, articulation of stressful reactions to normal events, it increases your risk of a heart attack, and this was in women specifically by 60%. So PTSD is a really important factor. Depression has also been looked at, and <coughs> when they've looked at angio angiogram patients, so patients who have been under a stressful situation, I wanna share with you that the most vulnerable demographics of depression and cardiovascular risk were young women, women under the age of 55, showing an increased risk of death with a statistically significant confidence interval, and men over age 65 were the other group that showed a statistical independent risk of cardiovascular death. When you looked at major adverse cardiovascular events, women under 55 were the highest group, uh, group demographic, and there are a lot of women who are affected by this economic crisis, and many might be single parents, um, all kinds of situations, business owners um, across the board um, who fit this profile in this particular demographic. So my, my intention of sharing this with you is to suggest we need to come together as a community and protect one another and recognize this with our patients as well. Okay. So this was a study that intrigued me. They looked specifically at the psychological stress and COVID-19, again, published just a few days ago, and they looked at the psychological stress affecting, if you can believe it, our gut microbiome and our circadian rhythm. The COVID-19 pandemic has provided many sources of stress, obviously, and I've covered that. Let's focus on this one right here, financial and long-term economic stress. And I will pull this one in here too, uh, relationship friction. A lot of people are having a very hard time homeschooling their children or being home with a, a house full of people, and, and it, it can be very, very challenging for a lot of people. So what they demonstrated here is that psychological stress modulates susceptibility severity and recurrence of viral infection, making those who feel this more vulnerable to the infection itself. Recent work shows that psychological stress increases the production of hypothalamic and amygdala corticotropin releasing hormone. And what does that do? Then we have a whole cascade of, of events. So this corticotropin releasing hormone has been studied as a precursor for the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access, kind of like the Think about like the steering wheel of a, of a big old sailboat. It like pretty much regulates everything. When this access is interrupted, it can lead to the production of adrenal hormones and, and cortisol. The corticotropin releasing hormone can also act on the mucosal mast cells to increase the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which not only affect the arteries, by the way, but they demonstrated how it acts on the gut epithelial cells to increase gut permeability. Really, really interesting, and we know the gut dysbiosis is a major, major also root cause of ill health from every angle, from cancer to cardiovascular disease and otherwise. By inducing an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines, in part via gut permeability and dysbiosis, Stress also lowers the levels of serotonin and melatonin, and when that's affected, which 
serotonin, as we know, is classically associated with depression, serotonin is also a precursor to producing melatonin. So it ultimately can release, low, ultimately lead to rather decreased levels of melatonin, which are going to do what? Affect our sleep and our circadian rhythm. So let me, we're at 11.30, so I want to just kind of keep moving through. So let's assume by chance that this work by Anderson and his colleagues um, suggests that the situation many people are under affecting um, the corticotropin releasing hormone, which is going to affect the whole parathyroid pituitary axis, which is going to lead to serotonin disruption, which is going to lead to potentially depression and uh, circadian rhythms, and then we're dealing with gut dysbiosis. What does all that lead to? Let's focus then for a moment on the cardiovascular release or, or risk, rather, related to sleep disturbances, potentially due to the acute stress related to COVID-19 and the serotonin cortisol disruption. We know that when people get less than five hours of sleep per night on average, um, compared to seven to eight, the risk of stroke goes up 83%. This has nothing to do with airway or sleep apnea. If someone is dealing with depression and cannot get out of bed and is in bed for more than eight hours, um, the odds ratio is about 74% increased risk of stress, I mean of, <laughs> of, of stroke risk. All right, so let's look at some other things. This is looking at um, association of sleep duration and quality with subclinical atherosclerosis. In this case, they did 3D, 3D vascular ultrasound studies, and they looked at atherosclerotic burden. Uh, vascular ultrasound can look at the intima media of the artery, and I won't get into that today, but it's a very appropriate a test to image atherosclerotic changes in the arteries. And what they show that if individuals, again, get less than six hours of sleep, it was independently associated with, I mean, they, they looked at everything else that could have caused this problem, and less than six hours changed the health of the artery wall, increased the risk of plaque development by 27%. The highest quartile of sleep fragmentation presented even a higher prevalence of 34%. These are people who sleep less, they can't stay asleep and fall asleep. Um, again, a really serious situation. All right, so let's start, when we recognize the risk of this situation on our emotional health, our physical health, our atherosclerotic risk, our interpersonal communication, et cetera, Let's move on now to talk about creative opportunities to actually stay connected and finding somehow a sense of normalcy in this unknown future. So this is at specifically your world. It, it was published by Meng and colleagues, and it was published in the Journal of Dental Research, and it was published last month. And it looked at the coronavirus disease evaluated in 2019, they looked at emerging and future challenges for dental and oral medicine. So in January, the World Health Organization announced that this outbreak had constituted a public health emergency of international concern. Starting February 26, it was recognized in 34 countries, at that time with 80,000 plus laboratory confirmed cases and already upwards of almost 3,000 deaths. And since then, it has doubled, quadrupled, and moved up exponentially, as we all know. These changes created abrupt and unexpected change in, in the world of dentistry like I've never seen professionally. Um, I wasn't in practice when the whole AIDS epide epidemic uh, broke out. Um, so I would, I don't know what the impact was then, but people are relating it to that, and I would even propose it's a bit um, bigger than that. Due to the characteristics of dental settings, they said, the risk of cross-infection may be high between dental practitioners and patients. For dental practices and hospitals in regions that are affected, which is basically everywhere, Effective infection control protocols are urgently needed, which is obviously what they're looking at now. Um, due to the unique characteristics of dental procedures where aerosols and droplets are generated in 
droves, um, the, the protection of the workers needs to be considered heavily, as you all know, um, especially in patients who are asymptomatic or in the incubation period. Um, up till now, there's been absolutely no consensus on the provision of dental services, and this was published in the Journal of Dental Research. Up until now, no consensus um, during this COVID-19 epidemic. So what is then the new normal? I mean, like, what is it? Um, it this is changing, obviously, the no novelty of COVID-19. And by the way, COVID-19 is part of the coronavirus family. Think of coronavirus as an umbrella, and under that you've got SARS, you've got viruses that cause a common cold, and the thing that COVID-19 has going for it is it's novel, it's new. Um, it is an encapsulated virus, so it is, you know, we can vaccinate for it, we can prevent it, but it's novel and it's new. Because of that, it's created this unknown factor across the board. Um, so, um, if people are in a, in a quandary of what it's going to do with dentistry and even uh, salar uh, salivary diagnosis. Inhalation of the airborne particles and aerosols produced during dental procedures obviously place everyone at risk. Therefore, it's crucial for dentists to refine preventative strategies to avoid COVID-19. What does that mean, negative airway in your operatories? Does it mean that you can't even look at a patient? Um, will you be in a, like a hazmat suit? I have no idea. But all of that, what I want to point out, creates an unknown even into the future. And I want to make sure that you're recognizing the potential grief of the beauty of the way things were, that things are going to be forever changed moving forward. Not bad, but definitely different. Uh, what will clinical care look like? How will we stay safe? Um, it's hard to know. It's hard to know what it looks like. And then from a patient standpoint, um, you know, a lot of data has been coming out of the, the hospitals looking at the impersonal and unfriendly portrayal of the human contact for these people because you don't even see a human face anymore. You can't hear a natural voice anymore. And all of that creates a change in dynamic of even human interaction. Implementation for dental care, um, given the widespread transmission of, of COVID-19, uh, COVID which is part of the SARS uh, viral family, obviously, um, it's going to change everything. The risk can be attributed to the unique nature of dental interventions, as I said before, aerosols, handling of sharps, proximity of the provider to the patient's oral pharyngeal region. Um, the inadequate precautions, if they're not taken, the dental office can potentially expose patients to cross-contamination. Given this, whoops, sorry, given this um, wide, oh, whoops, sorry, I'm messing with my arrows here. Here we go. Um, so dental offices are looking at even telescreening and triaging, which I had never heard in dentistry, but initial screening to identify patients who should come in, who might be suspected of COVID-19. And in the Journal of um, Endocrinology, published just a few days ago, actually, they looked at the three most pertinent, in question, pertinent in question, questions for initial screening. One, ask your patient any exposure to someone suspected of COVID-19, any recent travel to an area with high incidence. Number three, presence of any symptoms. <coughs> of febrile respiratory illness. And by the way, I've been talking a lot lately. I just had a preceptorship this weekend, which is my little tickle here. I don't have COVID, um, specifically fever or cough. Um, a positive response to either of the three questions should cause um, initial concern, and elective dental care should be deferred for at least two weeks while that patient is in quarantine. They also give you a beautiful little um, triage tree that you can look at. Um, kind of looking at urgency, elective care versus emergency care. Um, and you've got copies of all those slides, so all these slides, so I won't go over it. But they also give you an assessment of, is this really a true emergency? Does this patient really need to come in? And so they provide you with, with screens. And, and most, I'm sure you all have this, but I found it, um, there's more of this data coming out in the dental world than in the medical world, so I thought it was worthwhile to point out. Okay, so I want to kind of go into this, and then we're going to talk about proactive things I want us all to consider to do. 
um, how COVID-19 has changed healthcare, and this was done by Dr. Thomas Lee, published March 17, 2020, looking at the new normal and the clinician response to this. And he is an expert in care delivery models, so he was a perfect one to kind of give us some advice. He said, there's two interesting questions being raised by my colleagues, as he said, as we undertake new types of triage. Number one, will things ever go back to the way they were? And number two, are there things we are doing now that will become part of the new normal? He goes on to say, the answer to the first question is almost surely no. The COVID pandemic will, is going to be one of those um, dichot dichotomous events that divides life into before COVID and after COVID. We live through them, we learn from them, and we adjust. He also gave the example, which I thought was wonderful, of what life was like prior to 9-11. Going through the airport was like not even a big deal at all, and now it's our new normal. Um, going through blood draws um, and the start of intravenous for even IV therapy before HIV and now. So the world is different now for a lot of reasons, and, and it's not to be judged if it's good or better, but at some point it becomes our new normal. Um, the answer to the second question, he says, for good reasons, is almost surely yes. And not just certain high reliability practices for behaviors like hand hygiene. He said, we are actively redesigning the way we deliver care to do what is best for our patients during this time of crisis. Some aspects of that redesign will likely persist after the crisis has passed. Some medical providers are finding ways to triage even before people come in. And one doctor in his literature said, isn't this the way it always ought to be? Like, shouldn't we do a better job of triaging people of why they're coming in, what they're coming in for, is this the right place, place for them? And we've never had really anyone to do that except the front desk. So um, this particular doctor was pointing out this is actually a, a good thing, and I, I'm probably going to keep this going after COVID-19. He said, we are actively redesigning the way we deliver care to do best uh, during the crisis. I already said that one. Uh, we're learning new skills. Those skills will make us better, more convenient, and more affordable after the pandemic ends. Clinicians should cultivate those skills Why their administrative colleagues work on the business models to reward them. So as you are developing new delivery molecule, um, <laughs> molecules, I'm thinking science, uh, mechanisms, allow your administrative staff and colleagues to allow business models to be created from that that are going to be um, economically reliable moving forward. I thought that was a really good piece. So using our demands for change as an opportunity to create innovation and improvement in practice. This is, this is something I had mentioned earlier. This is the time that we have permission to make big changes. Patients expect big changes. Their life is different. So rocking the boat when life is normal is hard. Rocking the boat when you have to and expecting different uh, models of care delivery during this time is a beautiful opportunity to do that. Navigating the unprecedented, um, leading remotely. When a pandemic or disaster happens, it often requires those involved to change the way they perceive the world around them. We must lead our teams during rapid change and increased complexity is no different from that. During these times of unknown or unprecedented change, leaders, um, managers in offices, leaders of teams, um, must step back and re-examine the way they are leading, even if they are feeling high levels of ambiguity and stress. Um, Dr. Sawkick and colleagues and, and Stein and colleagues suggested this, that leaders rely on, on previous assumptions on how to navigate a new landscape. And is that right? While we need to rely on previous assumptions, um, we need to appreciate that the assumptions we had in January are going to be very different than the assumptions we may then carry in August of 2020. In times of rapid change, relying on, relying on set assumptions can provide some comfort in moving forward. However, things are different, so we must embrace the new normal, even in our decision making um, for or as leaders in, in a certain situation, and, and that's challenging. 
Um, how do you do that? One, establish clear goals. More than ever, clear goals are crucial. And maybe that is to provide the best and safest care to your community. Um, whatever your goals are, um, it's important you identify them, number one. Um, and then communicate those goals with your team. How, to sh how are you going to share this information with your team and your patients? How much information is shared? What internal changes do you share with the healthcare consumers that are seeing you? And also have a plan on when to roll out this communication. And bringing the team together to make those decisions that are appropriate to be made as a team so everyone has buy-in and everyone has a voice is, is extremely important. And then lastly, um, Sokik and, and Stein also said, look, technology is here. We've got to learn how to use it. And that's also a good change because it's available, it's inexpensive, and it's a way to, to navigate this uncharted territory. Okay. I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes, and then we'll open, or maybe five minutes, I don't know how long it will take, open up for questions. But I wanted to, with all of that we discussed, share with you the importance of taking care of yourself. Let's make this more internal right now. Um, let's, let's look at the value of asking ourselves, are we practicing mindfulness? Is our mind full, or are we being mindful? Same two syllables, meaning totally different situations. And ask yourself today, right now, is your mind full or are you being mindful? So let's look at that. When mindfulness is utilized, and in this case, they defined, I'm just going to share with you some data. This study looked at um, the idea of practicing mindfulness versus a comparative group that was just told to, to watch their stress. Um, mindfulness, they described, as allowing ourselves to be present in the current moment. And the implications were <coughs> people had to practice mindfulness in whatever way it works for you. Maybe it's deep breathing. Maybe it's listening to nice music. Maybe it's going for a walk. Maybe it's drawing in, a, in sand. Maybe it's doodling. Whatever it is that allows you to be in a, in a moment of presentness, presentness, and they looked at five endpoints in this study. They looked at angina, which is chest pain. They looked at systolic blood pressure, A1C levels, which are three-month average of blood sugars. They looked at anxiety and depression as self-reported by regulated screens. And the last was sleep onset and sleep efficacy. All of those factors are promoted by our current COVID-19 situation, as I I've discussed previously. Um, so did it work? The group that practiced mindfulness showed a statistically and impactful improvement on anxiety and depression in people that have major risk post-cutaneous post, um, uh, intervention, like post-angiogram um, and stenting. So it did show effect on anxiety and depression. Meditation also, when practiced at least 20 minutes once or twice a day with the following goals was examined by the American Heart Association. They wanted to know, and it did, increase concentration, insight, or awareness of the present moment, promote relaxation, reduce stress, settle the mind, achieve a state of increased consciousness, and reduce perceived suffering and increased happiness. All of those are incredibly important right now. Um, studies of meditation suggest a possible benefit for cardiovascular uh, risk reduction and should be, I added should, not may, um, they, the American Heart Association would not be so bold as to say should include, but I will add it, should be considered an adjunct therapy to reduce cardiovascular risk with the understanding the benefits remain to be obviously better understood. Um, but optimism, even being optimistic and excited about the future, is helpful. It reduces um, cardiovascular event risk by 35%, reduces all-cause death risk by 14%. That's hit by a bus, struck by lightning, dying of a heart attack or stroke, reduces your risk of that by 14%. So find ways to gain control over your perception of the current environment, 
find things to be optimistic about, as small or grand as they may be, because that's going to help your health as well. There are many, many free apps that I want you to utilize. You can get on your phone. And if nothing else, share this information. I've provided you with this entire PDF. Share it with your colleagues. Share it with your friends and family because it matters. Um, everyone's feeling this way. Practice mindfulness on a regular basis to help with your stress and anxiety. So I'm going to give you one quick tool to leave with, and that is this is one exercise of many that just says, look, give yourself some credit. Um, this is one exercise that office-based mindfulness can do. They said, and it's true, we are our own worst critic. So allowing time for gratitude during the day can be difficult a mix a jam-packed, or in this case, a disrupted schedule, but it should be a priority. They suggest make a list of your accomplishments that day, including little things like, man, I, I got up on time. I didn't even push the snooze button. <laughs> and you write those things down, and your mindset will instantly shift back to a positive place. And you'll give yourself little pats on the back for the things you're doing right versus the things you're doing wrong. It might be as simple as, oh my gosh, I ate an apple today. I didn't eat that extra cookie. Wow, I'm, I'm good. I took a walk. Because I promise you, this day will come um, where we can hug each other again, that we can touch each other, that we can be with our patients face to face, that we can be that sort of natural biological being that is a, a, a basically a communicative mammal that needs other people to survive and needs that interpersonal communication. That time will come. But in the meantime, please be kind to yourself. Appreciate that we're all going through these stages of grief in different ways. It's, it's understandable. It's respectful. And the outcomes of mismanagement of those feelings are not healthy. So trying to manage our feelings, and the first part of that is recognition, is extremely important. So with that, um, Taylor, um, I'm going to go ahead and close the formal presentation. I would, I would love to answer any questions or get feedback from anybody. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Nadine. That was such wonderful content. We're so thankful that you were able to share with us. Um, I want to pass it over real quick to Dr. Cooch if you have any thoughts or, or comments that you have thought of that you want to address to the, to the audience today. Yeah, I, I've got a whole page of notes here, but Amy, I want to thank you. That was uh, You hit on some topics here that I think we all need to be mindful about and just recognize, you know, what we're all going through. You know, we hear the words unprecedented and et cetera, but to each of us on a personal level, uh, there's so many different, lo I think, new stress factors in our lives as a result of this, and then just trying to find a halfway through it and, you know, and get to that new normal. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that dentistry, I'm with you, it's been hit very, very hard. Um, I mean, all of my colleagues, as I talk to people and, and within my own practice and, and friends and colleagues as we've been doing this, had a lot of feedback. And this has been a really challenging time, uh, much more so than, you know, when we were practicing through the HIV uh, scare back in the, uh, in the 1980s. And I would just say, I'm going to talk about specific um, new protocols on May 7th on this program uh, about what we need to address and think about going forward. And it is going; it, we're not going back to the world that we were in uh, six weeks ago. And and I think it's we're going to have a new normal. And like everything else, it's going to be, you know, we're we're going to adjust to it and actually come out of this, you know, better and safer on the other side. Um, we, we will all make those adjustments. One of the things about dentistry in particular because of the aerosols, uh, I'll just mention this briefly, but in um, Business Insider did a review of 974 different jobs in the United States and looked at 125,000 people. And of that, the number one most risky job in terms of your personal health, number one was dental hygiene and number two was general dentistry. So these are concerns that, you know, We'll find a way through this and figure out how to do this, but we can't go back to where we were. Your patients, our patients are walking into the bank or they're walking into Home Depot or the grocery store 
or Costco and, and you're being forced to stand six feet apart, there's hand sanitizers, you know, people are wearing masks, there are spit screens at the check register, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to be dealing with those things on an even more organic level in the operatory when it comes to aerosols. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. Amy, I want to thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. And I, um, and I want to thank you. I know we've got some great questions and you have limited time. So I want to turn this back to you. Thanks, Kim. I great. appreciate that very much. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you so much, both of you. Now, yes, we did get a couple of questions come in. So let's go ahead and ask those real quick. Um, one of the questions was, what are your top most important actionable items that we can take back into the practices for triaging patients as they arrive to the dental practice? Yeah, um, I, I'm not a dentist or a hygienist, so um, I can't speak to the practicality of, of dental practice. Um, but coming at this from an emotional health level, I want to acknowledge that heart attacks and strokes, although COVID-19 is definitely a significant situation, heart attacks and strokes remain the top of the list of death and disability. So knowing that this situation has potentially increased our patients' risk of heart attacks and strokes for all the reasons I mentioned, realize that, that I want you to even do a more thorough job in assessing someone's emotional, physical, cardiovascular risk as they enter into your dental office. Because one thing I know for certain is that patients will flock to their dental office, as I will, as soon as the doors open. And you will be the first line of screen for those patients. And so my bias would be if you could even have some sort of simple how are you doing? Um, anxiety, depression screen, make sure and check those blood pressures, make sure and check um, their, their sort of risk because they'll be inflamed and, and just be respectful of the fact they're coming to see you potentially with some added risk to their already vulnerable arteries and, and I just want to kind of state that. I can't state to how dentistry is going to change. I just respect it a lot. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, another question someone said was, I've seen that prescriptions for SSRIs and anti-anxiety medications have spiked during the pandemic. How can these affect cardiovascular and general health? Yeah, good question. Um, SSRIs um, have not been shown to have a negative cardiovascular um, impact, whether it be on blood pressure, vascular inflammation. The effect of not treating depression and anxiety does have a cardiovascular impact, and that's for the SSRIs. The anti-anxiety drugs are a little bit different in that if they are drugs that affect um, anxiety, such as more on the scheduled side, such as um, Xanax and Alpralazam, those are not favorable, and we try to make sure patients have other coping mechanisms to deal with those. Um, but the SSRIs, um, which are used for social anxiety, are used for mild anxiety, and are used certainly for depression, and showing you the data on the serotonin adjustments, being on a serotonin uptake um, medication might be just what someone needs for a while as they develop internal coping, coping mechanisms to move forward. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so we did have a couple other questions. I don't think we have time for that necessarily right now, so we'll just go ahead and do the wrap-up. Thank you again so much, Dr. Donin um, and Dr. Cooch, for your time and your input. We really appreciate it. Um, so just a couple of wrap-up items. Um, the CE, again, will be going out to you in your email. Um, and then you can look for the recordings, again, at our Facebook group and in the emails that we send out. Uh, please don't miss tomorrow's course. We are going to be having marketing coach and dental assistant Jenny Bullman. Um, she will be talking about how to effectively market your practice during this time. Her course title is Leaders Don't Hide, Anchoring Patients' Loyalty with Consistent Marketing. And then finally, thank you again so much, everybody, for attending. We're having so much fun bringing everybody in for these courses and giving us all a bit of distraction from what is going on all around us. So uh, that takes care of everything on my end. Dr. Dunin, do you have any final closing words for us, anything you want to leave us with? 
No, just be kind to yourself. And, and one thing I just want to acknowledge, I'm seeing now on the Q&A that we lost sort of verbal or sound for a while, and I hope that wasn't too disruptive. I didn't know that was going on, so I apologize to anybody that felt stress from the fact they couldn't hear me. So I just want to acknowledge that. Well, I didn't realize that. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Yes, it did and, come, come back eventually, and it was it was good at the end. So <laughs> thank you. Okay. Yeah, just thank you so much, Amy. I, I, I know you've got a meeting to get to. I, I appreciate this so much. This information is so important, and I just hope that all of the dental professionals get an opportunity to, to hear this because um, I think it's really helpful just to understand what we're all feeling and going through. And so I'm, I'm going to spend the rest of the day being kind to myself. Thank you, Amy. Good, good, perfect. All right, well, thanks for having me, uh, Kim, and thanks again to Taylor and Kendall for, for organizing this. And way to go uh, for setting these up. I think it's such a great thing you guys are doing, and so I'm honored to be part. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Everybody stay safe and have a wonderful day. Okay, all right, yep. take bye -bye, care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.